Good morning once again. We are very happy to have you to share with us during this period of time. We ask that you continue to pray for our nation, pray for our churches, wherever they may be. And at this time, we're going to pray. Almighty God, we come at this time thanking you for allowing us this opportunity to come once again. We pray, Almighty God, that you would teach us how to pray, how to love one another, how to forgive and be patient and know that you're God. We pray for those less fortunate we are today, Almighty God, those, Almighty God, on their beds of affliction, those who are going through mama's of bereavement. We ask, Almighty God, to continue to be with us, strengthen us, keep us as our prayer in the name of We ask it all in the name of Jesus, our prayer forever. Amen. This morning, we're going to call your attentions to the book of the Judges, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 11. The book of Judges, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 11. We're going to talk this morning a setback for God's setup. A setback for God's setup. Things are not always as they seem, but God is able to take that seemingly bad situation and use it as a setup for a blessing. The way you start out is no indication of how the journey will conclude. And starting from behind does not mean that your destiny is inextricably bound to the back of the pack. That's a proven athletic fact. Ask any coach who has experience in the area of track and field. The greatest long distance runners can come uh, from the continent of Africa, specifically Kenya. Kip, Kip Kino, the famed long distance runner, and coach instituted what we now call high altitude training. Coach Kip, as he is officially called, discovered that the rigors of training at higher elevations prepare the body to adjust and deal with lower altitudes. Coach Kip trains all of his runners to spend time at higher elevations. Anyone who enjoys track and field or the Olympics will notice something uh, different about the Kenyan style of running. When Kenyans run, they always run in a pack. They want to make sure everyone on the team comes in first, second, or third. Also, you will notice that Kenyans athletes never start by leading the pack. As a matter of fact, they spend the majority of the race bringing up the rear. If you watch the Olympics, you will assume the Kenyans are going to lose. If it is, uh, if it is a 30 minute race and you watch 24 minutes and 59 seconds, you will be convinced that the Kenyans will come in last place. But something happens toward the end of the race. It is at this precise moment that the Kenyan runners began to kick and expand in numerous efforts. And when they kick, they utilize those muscles that they were trained at high altitude and low oxygen in an effort to handle the low altitude and high oxygen conclusion. Because Kenyan runners have been trained at a higher altitude with low oxygen, it's easy for them to run past the competition during a low altitude, a high oxygen movement moment. When Kenyans kick, they alter their physical position and their thought processes which ultimately changes their conclusion. At first glance, it might appear that Kenyan runners 
who started from behind might remain behind. But their starting lineup, their initial positioning, does not mean that the finish line is not within their grasp. How they start out is not how they end up. So it is not how you start in life's race that's important. It's how you prepare and it is how you finish and conclude. Just because you started out one way does not mean you have to remain in that particular state, change, uh, change your position, and that will change your conclusion. Um, most of us believe our sociological condition is the same as our spiritual destiny. The collective and socioeconomic factors that shape the physical condition and psychological reality in our community does not have the found word uh, of our destiny. If your destiny is to do great social justice work for God, your family, your friends, and your co-workers, then ultra-conservative public policies have nothing to do with your destiny. The problem is we are uh, constantly tuned and dialed into the wrong frequency forecasting our conclusions. Some times ago, as we were traveling in the Midwest, I listened to a weather report, and I thought it was for Texas, and it was for another area. I messed up. I got the weather report wrong. What I was listening to had nothing to do with where I was or my present reality. Are you getting what I'm talking about? That is exactly what the enemy does. The enemy wants you to listen to your past reports that have nothing to do with your present reality. Uh, just like the Kenyan runners, how they start running is not how they finish the race. So delete whatever the devil has downloaded into the computer chip of your brain. Your past is just the prologue and not the final chapter of your journey. Now, if you're willing to understand that God has a greater thing for you, then God can transform your life. According to our text, Jasper, was a mighty warrior who was a son of a prostitute. His father was Gilead and his mother was a prostitute. Now, Eugene Peterson's biblical translation states that he was a son of a whore, but he was a tough warrior. His father, Gilead, stepped by side of the boundaries of marriage and struck with another woman. And if one looked at this text with the human unit of suspicion from a womanist vantage point, one might say that Jesper's mother was probably not, I say probably not, a prostitute, but just a woman who was caught in a web of sexual power relations. In order to protect the man's Integrity within a periodical society, a man would often label the other woman a prostitute, especially if he had forced himself upon her. She could he could keep a degree of integrity by violating her integrity. The Bible says that Jephthah was a mighty warrior and the son of a prostitute. He was a mighty warrior and the son of a prostitute. You, you, you missed it. He was a mighty warrior, but a son of a prostitute. Are you getting what I'm talking about? Uh, your dysfunction has nothing to do with your destiny. You can start out one way, 
But you don't have to end up that way. That is not your conclusion. God will use the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the dismissed, the disregarded, the distressed, the humanized, the outcast, and oppressed for the kingdom good. Jephthah was a mighty warrior and the son of a prostitute. To the people, we say God cannot use. God is saying, come here, I can use you. Doesn't matter what you've done, come here, I can use you. The Bible records just with this function, but also give account of his destiny. And some of us are afraid to deal with our dysfunction. We don't want to engage our destiny. But I'm here today to tell you, you don't need to clean your slate or sanitize uh, your history. God can deal with whatever past that you might have. God can deal with your problems. God can handle all of those imperfections. The kind of God we serve can deal with your dysfunction and take you to your destiny. It doesn't matter if the community is ringing you off. God is able to pick you up and clean you up. God has said, come, I can use you. This is the beauty of what is called the scandal of grace. According to the German theologian and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer, God loves the people. We do not love. Did you hear what I said? God loves the people that we do not love. The scandal of grace. We all can relate. If people only knew the dungeon that you crawled out this morning to make your way to church. If people only knew the kind of mess in our lives, the kind of dysfunction in our families, the kind of hell we go through. If they knew the kind of pain behind our shouts and behind our songs, it would make somebody's head spend this morning. But thanks be to God, we're all still here. I don't know if anybody here has ever been through anything and you're just glad that you made it into the house of the Lord one more time. And but you're here by God's grace. Of God upload into your spirit that your dysfunction cannot stop your destiny. Dysfunction may change your testimony, but it will not stop your destiny. When we look at the text this morning, uh, Jephthah is in conflict with his family. He is, like most of us, a product of dysfunction. Jephthah brothers ran out on him, ran him out of town with the help of his stepmother. I cannot imagine the pain placed upon one spirit when those who are supposed to love you push you to the margins of society. In a perfect world, Jephthah's family uh, would support him, but sometimes blood, did you hear what I said? Sometimes blood family members will block your blessing. Sometimes the very people charged with caring for you are also the ones trying to destroy you. Jesper's brothers spoke against him, but his father was silent. He is not unlike many of the young brothers caught in the prison industrial complex uh, who are clueless about the name and whereabouts uh, of the one they call father. We know Jesper's lineage but his daddy says nothing. How many of our children who have been kissed by nature's son live a life of exile because daddy was silent? Jesper's daddy was silent 
And as a result of his daddy's meekness, he was a now a child living in exile in the land of Tob. Here we find something interesting here in the text. We have all the historical, cultural, rhetorical criticism necessary to help us understand the intended narrative and metaphorical meaning of the text. But absent is the powerful transforming agent called love. Jesper's family had an issue with his lineage and refused to love a boy born in a dysfunctional situation. Without love, our children live in exile. You can talk about lineage, you can talk about heritage, and you can talk about culture. But if you don't have love, the tragic oversight will crush the fragile hearts of children. How many times, just how many times, the church members have been so judgmental of children? How is it you're able to look on that child and see what that child is going to amount to? We call that this death at an early age where a child is condemned just because of where he is and where he came from. But thank God he's able to take that child that came from nowhere and set him up and make something out of him. Great God Almighty. And that like a love leads to what we call sometimes a wayward, a vain, or a thug life. When love is removed from the equation, we are left with that the children craving the very thing they have not received. Our society, even the church, does not like the word love. We like other words. We like blessings and anointing and going to the next level. We like seeds. We like to talk about God hooking us up, but love must come back home to take residence in our theological vocabulary. What the world needs now is love. The gospel is clear. Love is spiritual discipline. God is love and God has power and love has power. The missing element for this generation development is an understanding of divine love and self-love freed from the limitations of market-driven indulgences. One might call it old school, but old school love is like I came up, the kind of love that is rooted in community and commitment. The kind of love says, take your hat off when you come inside. The kind of love says, no, sir, and yes, ma'am. The kind of love says, pull your pants up. Uh, stop showing your rear end. The kind of love says, don't curse in front of your elders. This kind of love made us hold our heads high in the face of oppression. This kind of love tells us this poet, William Copper, dead in Negro complaint, fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nation's claim. Skins may differ, but affection dwells in white and black. This saying, this saying, the kind of love says, you don't have a right, young people, to get a D on F. Do you know who died for you? I am talking about the kind of love that says, dressing like a pimp isn't cute. And dressing like a stripper isn't sexy. It is a kind of love your parents demonstrated when you messed up your Easter speech. Yet she put her arms around you and said, it's all right, baby, just wait till we get home. We're going to straighten it out. And it's not going to happen again. When you have love in your life, you walk different. You talk different. You act different when somebody loves you. It is a long time Peace activist and minister 
William Cuffin who said, it is not because we have there that we are loved, but because we are loved that we have there. French philosopher was wrong when he said, uh, I think therefore I am. And if we are to reclaim our children who have been written off, we must begin with love. My brothers and sisters, love has power. Love tells a broken person, you have oil pumping in your living room. There is something profound in the African-American tradition when a witness of God's glory shouts, the Lord woke me up this morning. It is theological, a modern rep in this simple folk statement, God's grace casts a shadowing, a uh, love shadow on a people economically exploited, uh, political abandoned, and theological demonized by Western culture. Yet God's concern is not redacted by race, class, or gender. God loves us enough to wake us up to fight another day. I'm not done in your life, says God. You still have things to do. And I stopped by this morning to tell you that God is not are done with you. You still have speeches to write. You still have books to author. You still have businesses to start. You have sermons to preach, letters to read, uh, children to inspire, poems to perform, food to cook, cares to create, bars to raise children to love, hurdles to jump, rivers to cross, and mountains to climb. So my brothers and sisters, Jasper had no love in his life. They sent him to the land of Tob. He was an exile in the land of Tob. The word Tob means good place. I'm coming back to that in a minute because love did not live in Jasper's house. He was put on a path to a thug life. Remember, Jasper was hated because of his lineage. His brother hated his heritage. Uh, his brother, his father was Gilead, but his mother, remember, was a prostitute. The brothers hated him because of his DNA. The brothers feared his heritage because when Jasper became a man, he would be in position to upset the economic structure. His connection to his father meant he was in position to receive an inheritance. Jasper's brothers had to disenfranchise him in order to protect the economic order, uh, inclusion of Jasper's in the boardroom, meant a new distribution of the family wealth, and the brothers were not interested in sharing with Jasper. We recognize Jasper's pain because we have experienced the hatred of our heritage. Our fleecy locks and dark complexion, complexion points to our roots on the continent of Africa, the institution of slave codes, the Dred Scott decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, were all attempts to drive us into the land of Toad. It was not just color or lineage, but fear of losing power or having to share wealth with another member of the family. The text states that the brothers did not want to share their inheritance uh, with Jasper. The brothers instituted their own segregation policy to protect their financial resources. Racism is not solely rooted in color. But it is a socially constructed demonetization of black culture designed to keep people of African descent uh, disempowered and separated from the institution of social economic empowerment. Jasper was living uh, a third life in Tob. The Bible states that he lived with vain people, 
uh, outlaws. Uh, the Hebrew meaning of tub is a good place. It does not make sense for the place of excommunication and exile to be called good. But sometimes a setback is a setup for God to do something in your life. Even though his family did not want him, there were thugs who said, we will embrace you. We will love you. Uh, we are going to embrace you. We will train you. God will provide for you, a new family, uh, if your old one rejects you. When you go into some of the public restrooms, there's an interesting set up there. After you do what you came in there to do, the only way to get rid of the stuff in the urinal is to turn and walk away. And you can't flush it away. You have to turn away from the situation. So the senses know you're done with this chapter of your journey. And if you keep facing the mess, it will continue to linger. But if you turn and walk away, it will be permanently removed. The only way to get rid of some people in your life is to turn and walk away and let God do the flushing. So Jephthah now is living the third life in tow. But this is a good place because God is preparing to use his thug skill for a kingdom blessing. Let's talk about thugs. Thugs are loyal. When a thug uh, down for you, child calls. You don't have to worry about a thug skipping town or calling in sick on this day of your protest. Sometimes I would rather have a thug behind me than some church folk because I don't have to worry about the thug stab stabbing me in the back. We serve a God who has a special place in God's heart for thugs and theologians. God rolls with a brother named Peter. And any time Peter gets in trouble, he pulls out a switchblade ready to cut somebody. When Jesus died, he hung out with two thugs on a cross. When God picked his greatest apostle, he called a thug from Tarsus called Saul. Jesus loves thugs. So yes, thugs are loyal. And thugs tell the truth. If thugs don't like something, they will tell you. Ask any thug on the street, why don't you come to church? And they will give you an honest answer. There are hypocrites up there. And I know I'm, an, I'm, I know I'm a hypocrite. And I know I'm not doing right. See, you know, church folk will try to act perfect and will sanitize their lives. Uh, perfect. Not rationalize. We all have a little thug history. We have thugs in our family. We have thugs as friends. Thugs can reach Thugs. There are some people we we will never reach, but all it takes is one thug to tell another somebody that truth about the transformation power of God. When a thug gets saved, he's able to communicate with many that most of saved folk want to dismiss. Jephthah is now living in the land of Tob, living the life, the thug life with his crew. But watch what happens while God comes in. Uh, the thug uh, is on the outskirts and does not think he will ever come back home. Then all of a sudden the same people here uh, who kicked him out of town saying, come here. We need your thug skills to destroy the Ammonites. And Jethro says, hold on a minute. Are you all the same folk who kicked me out? Are you the same folk who rolled up on me? And told me to get out of town. I wasn't getting anything. So then I found a crew in Tob. That surrounded me with love. And now you want me to come back? Jethro went to know why he is now being sought. They want him back because they're, he's an expert in, exurgence, in exurgency. They want him back because he has expertise in guerrilla warfare. And they, well, they don't know how to deal with Ammonite. Because their policy was ill-conceived. And when they engaged them in war, those in the land of Tob realized that they needed someone with the mentality who could handle that thing. And so Jess would make the decision to go back. But on one condition, he will go back if he is in charge. 
They said, let the Lord be a witness between us. And if you defeat the armies of the Ammonites, then you will be in charge. I like how God orchestrates the situation. Because we serve a second chance God. A third chance God and a thousand time God. We serve a God who will give you another chance. But here's the thing. Jasper is thankful for his haters in the land of Tobah. He is grateful for the lack of insight. You completely missed it. One writer said you have got to be thankful for your haters. If you got one hater, you need five more. If you got five, you need ten more. Haters do what haters do. Haters just hate. And if you're doing God's work, you're going to have haters. So come on, haters, hate on me. It just means that you're going to elevate me and take me to another level. Is there anybody here who has haters in your life? You thank God for your haters because your haters uh, taught you how to pray. Thank God for your haters. Sometimes you've got to give God praises for your haters. And God will save thugs because God loves thugs. God calls the rejected. God calls the broken. God calls the thugs. God calls the thugettes. Those living on the margins, the bourgeois people, I want you to know that God can save you. If God can save a drunk like Noah, if God can use a pimp like Abraham, if God can use a hustler like Jacob, if God can use a thugette like Deborah, if God can use a baller like Samson, if God can use a player like David, if God can use a player like Solomon, if God can use a ghetto soldier like Peter, and a roughneck like Paul, God can use, and he can use me, he can use you. That's what God is able to do today. He's able to see you through. Stop being so judgmental. You never know what you're going to come to before you leave here. As one thing for sure, we're leaving here. But who knows what you're going to need tomorrow. Be careful how you treat people. Stop being so judgmental. You cannot look on that child and tell what that child is going to amount to. You don't know that. Be careful you don't know who you're going to need. Stop being so judgmental. Never look down on a person unless you're looking down to pick him up. God has been good to all of us. God can use you. If God can use me, I know he can use you. Give God a chance today. I don't know about you, but while the blood is running warm in your veins today, I've given my life to him. He's been good. He's brought us a long way.